I need a serious time out in the bathroom. Splash water on my face and make sure I don't look like a total loser. I hate that class. It's so fucking boring. Life is Strange is one of my favorite games of all time. It's not perfect by any means, and you can easily find things to nitpick and pop fun at, but as with most of my favorite games, it is the roughness of it that fascinates me. Despite not being technically flawless, you can see that the developers poured their hearts into the game and that they really believed in what they had to say. Again, there is plenty to criticize in Life is Strange, but that's the price you pay when you attempt to create something raw and vulnerable. Not everything will land, but in this case, the highest highs are well worth the lowest lows. One of the things that makes Life is Strange such an engaging and coherent narrative is the focus on a few key elements, a strategy which many other pieces of media have also found successful. With Life is Strange, you can point to the relationship between Max and Chloe, the rich setting of Arcadia Bay, or Max's ever-evolving time travel powers. However, for this video, I wanted to narrow my focus even further, and explore how Life is Strange uses photography and art as a central motif, thus creating a strong identity for itself. Before we get started though, it might be wise to go over the game's basic plot, as well as the definition of a motif. If you are already familiar with these, feel free to skip to this part in the video. Life is Strange is a story-based adventure game developed by Don't Not Entertainment and published by Square Enix in 2015. The player takes the role of Max Caulfield, an 18-year student and aspiring photographer who returns to her old hometown of Arcadia Bay for her last year in high school. There, she notices having unexpectedly been gifted with the ability to rewind time, which she uses to save the life of her childhood friend Chloe Price. Despite having grown apart during Max's time in Seattle, the two quickly reconnect. The game then follows their adventures as they navigate their newly rekindled relationship, investigate the missing students of Blackwell Academy, and attempt to make sense of Max's ominous visions. Motif is a term used in art and literature studies closely related to the theme. Though whereas themes usually refer to abstract concepts gradually introduced and explored throughout the entire work, Motif can simply be a concrete, reoccurring element in the work. To use an obvious example, in superhero media, costumes and masks are a recurring motif. In gaming, we can point to the Master Sword as a recurring motif in the Legend of Zelda series. Obviously, motifs are often chosen and used for a specific reason, and even if they aren't, their usage alone can create messages and meaning. So before we get started, I'd also like to point out that personally, I don't believe that the intention of the author needs to be accounted for when analyzing their work. It can be useful, but one of the great things about art, especially games, is how we can all experience them in our own ways. Not only is every gaming experience different, but we also bring our own biases and preconceptions into them, which makes us see connections and meanings that someone else might not. Art is at its best, a mirror that reflects parts of ourselves back at us. And as will soon become clear, my experience with Life is Strange has definitely been a personal one. Full spoilers for the game will follow. The most obvious usage of photography as a motif in Life is Strange is Max herself. She is, after all, an aspiring photographer, and quite skillful in fact, since she manages to get her work exhibited in an art gallery by the end of the game. And I think looking at the different elements of the game as an extension of or commentary on Max's photography helps to show how much of it is connected. The player, as Max, can literally take photographs throughout the game, and her photographer identity helps close the distance between the character and the player. Max is someone who looks at things from the distance, making observations much like the player themselves. In fact, the simple act of looking can be described as a kind of photography. Shouldn't you be taking photos? I am always taking photos. I am a camera. However, that is only the most surface level interpretation. For example, 
we can look at Max's time travel powers as an extension of her identity as a photographer. Just like photography is about accessing past moments through captured images, so do Max's powers allow her to briefly access her immediate past. Oh, that was so surreal. Famously called film, little pieces of time. But he could be talking about photography, as he likely was. Okay. Ah, oh, Dolly, what a fantastic eye. He could truly freeze time. In fact, the screen blurs, much like a photograph, whenever Max rewinds time, and it begins to resemble a wrongly developed photograph whenever she tries to travel too far into the past. This not only connects Max's power visually to her photographer persona, but also emphasizes their unnaturalness and the damage that they cause. Max's powers can also be seen as a metatextual extension of the player. How often have we made decisions in games that we have immediately wanted to take back? The usual reloading or saves coming has, in the case of Life is Strange, been turned into a game mechanic that creates a connection between the player and Max herself. You can also see how Max's persona as a photographer changes once she has acquired her powers. By her own admission, Max used to be a reclusive person, always observing others from a distance, much like a photographer would. But with her powers, she has the ability to fix her mistakes, to redo any interactions that she isn't satisfied with. It is only with this added security that she finally begins to connect with her fellow students. Dana's been sexting with my boyfriend. Ouch. How did you find out? Uh, why do you care? Why are you even in fact, asking some me? some conversations you require the player to rewind time in order That's to complete them. To you now. Yet one What's might ask name? if ones like these are actually real. After all, it is often by redoing the conversations with her fellow students that Max is able to convince them of her interest. She didn't care enough to learn about them before, and is only able to forge these bonds with the added security of her rewind powers. Then again, Max definitely wants to connect with her fellow students, but has simply been too afraid to do so. This conflict is best articulated by Max herself, via her dark reflection. Can you get me out of here? Oh, so you want help? <laughs> Thought you could control everybody and everything, huh? Twist time around your fingers? I tried to help. I only wanted to do the right thing. No, you only wanted to be popular. And once you got these amazing powers, your big plan was to trick people into thinking you'd give a rat's ass. This raises the age-old question of whether the ends justify the means. Are the bonds Max creates less valuable because they were created with the help of her powers? A similar question can be asked about photography as well. In the case of nature photography and photojournalism, it is being able to capture singular, fleeting moments in time that creates value. Max seems to largely subscribe to this school of thought with the types of photographs she takes. But even this is muddled by how she uses her powers. The player is able to rewind any missed photograph opportunities and try again. In general, Max is no longer simply capturing moments in time, she is manipulating them. If the moments she captures are no longer unique, are the photographs she takes less valuable as well? I want to keep the focus on Max a while longer and explore how her time manipulating powers evolve throughout the game. Perhaps the most obvious comparison between her powers and photography is the moment in episode 2 when Max, in an attempt to save her friend Kate from suicide, manages to freeze time. For a moment, the unyielding fall of time has been stopped, with the moment frozen in place, just like in a photograph. It would be easy to see this as the ultimate expression of Max's power, but in the subsequent episodes the game goes even further than that and underlines the connection between photography and the themes of the game. In the third episode, wanted to save Chloe's dad William from death, Max travels years into the past using a photograph taken at Chloe's house when they were 13. It is only by utilizing a photograph, an actual physical moment from the past, that she is able to travel beyond her usual time limit. 
She is quite literally traveling into her memories through a memento, by bringing the moment more clearly into focus. But the past is something that we can ultimately never get back. It turns out that Max's attempt to improve Chloe's life ends up making it so that she experiences the traumatic car crash instead of her father. Unlike her father, Chloe avoids death, but becomes paralyzed and dependent on expensive treatments with her condition rapidly declining. After spending a perfect day with Max, Chloe asks her help to end her life. Listen, Max. My respiratory system is failing and... Uh, and it's only getting worse. I've heard the doctors talking about it when they thought I was zonked out. So I know I'm just putting off the inevitable while my parents suffer along, and I will too. This isn't how I want things to end. What? What are you saying? I'm saying that being with you again has been so special. I just wanted to feel like when we were kids running around Arcadia Bay and everything was possible and you made me feel that way today. I want this time with you to be my last memory. Whether the player follows this request or not, Max then immediately decides to travel back to her original timeline. This pattern repeats itself throughout the rest of the game. Max attempts to fix things by repeatedly traveling to the past through various photographs which only ends up tearing the fabric of reality even more severely. In the end, the only way for Max to stop the destruction of Arcadia Bay is to sacrifice Chloe, to return to the moment where she first used her powers to save Chloe's life and do nothing. Whether the player chooses to sacrifice Chloe or the rest of Arcadia Bay, one thing is clear. Max cannot have it all. The perfect past that she so desperately tries to return to is beyond her reach, gone forever. This idea of the intoxicity of nostalgia and the futility of attempting to recapture the past is echoed throughout the game. It is not a coincidence that Max and Chloe are both 18, just at the end of their childhood, yet not fully adults either. Throughout the game, the memories of their innocent childhood are juxtaposed by the dark elements of the adult world drug use, murders, and abuse. Max revisits many precious places from her childhood, which makes her realize just how much things have changed. What do you truly want to do when you grow up? Max, I'm already grown up. What about you? Travel. That would be awesome. Explore the world, go far from here. Far from me? Thanks a lot, dude. Dude, you would totally come with me. I need a bodyguard for our adventures. I would be like Lara Croft, except real. That would be majorly cool. Totally. We'd have cars and boats and planes all over for instant escape. And no adults could tell us what to do. Count me in. What would you do while I was bodyguarding you? Maybe take pictures of our adventures. I would love to be a photographer. As if I ever could be. What are you talking about? Max, you are a photographer. Your pictures could be in a museum. Someday they will. I believe in you. At this point, I would like to share a personal anecdote from my own life. When I first played through Life is Strange, I had just moved out of my childhood home. For the first time in my life, I was living on my own. But what I originally thought of as a joyous and exciting occasion quickly turned into something a lot more depressing. I was living in a city with no friends or family around and soon realized that I hated the field that I had chosen to study. Eventually, I dropped out. For the first time in my life, I had no direction. My future was empty. And because of that, my past started to seem a lot brighter in comparison. The simple days of hanging out with my friends felt a lot more desirable compared to the cold reality of the present day. And it was because of those feelings that Life is Strange truly spoke to me with how it presents nostalgia as almost dangerously desirable. It's also because of those feelings that I chose to play Max and Chloe as friends trying to reconnect with each other, foregoing the possible romance between them. 
I think playing them as a couple is perfectly valid, but I personally connected with the story a lot more when it was about two friends attempting to desperately recapture the lost days of their childhood instead of moving past that into something else entirely. So with all that, I guess we can move on from Max and talk about some of the other characters in the game. Max is not the only character who can be perceived through her relationship with photography and art. The aforementioned Kate, for example, is driven to suicide when video footage of her acting scandalously at a party begins to circulate. In this case, a captured moment of Kate's past is not used as a tool, but as a weapon against her. Sometimes the unyielding flow of time can be a merciful thing, especially when there are things that we want to move past. Why does he think that? Because he saw the video. You know how humiliating this is for me? I know this sucks, Kate, but tell me about the video and maybe I can help. Basically, I went to one Vortex Club party and ended up making out with a bunch of people. And I have no memory of it. Similarly, Chloe's stepdad David uses photographs and video surveillance to, in his mind, ensure the security of Blackwell Academy and his home. Other characters raise issues about this, which again reminds us that the act of photography is not in and of itself a neutral one, but can infringe on the rights of others and cause serious damage. Chloe was doing drugs! That's illegal! So is spying on people in your family and at your work. Why do you have photos of Kate, Marsh, and Rachel Amber in your files anyway? What? Is this true, Max? Yes, David, why do you have these files at all? I find this very disturbing. Out of all the other characters, Max's classmate Nathan Prescott and her teacher Mark Jefferson are the most prominent comparisons to her. They both have picked, like Max, photography as their chosen form of expression. However, their approaches are pretty much the opposites of Max's. In one possible scenario, Nathan uses a photo collage to intimidate Max, crudely combining existing photographs into something grotesque. Instead of capturing existing beauty, Nathan's photograph carries the implication of violating that which already exists. Interestingly, he is one of the few characters who uses photography to influence the future instead of capturing the present. The other notable exception is of course Max. Nathan's regular photography, on the other hand, is all black and white, possibly reflecting his depressed mental state and warped worldview. As the son of the influential Prescott family, Nathan's world has been simplified into an us versus them kind of mentality, and he's unable to sympathize with the people around him. Jefferson takes this idea even further. His photography is revealed to be about drugging and kidnapping students of Blackwell Academy and capturing their last moments on film. Ignoring the obvious moral abhorrence of this, Jefferson's photography is pretty much the antithesis of Max's. Whereas Max focuses on observing life as is and capturing its passing moments, Jefferson violently manipulates reality and his subjects in order to get his shots. At the same time, we can see Max moving closer to this direction throughout the game. Thanks to her time manipulation powers, she is able to move from being an observer into being an actor. Instead of simply capturing moments in reality, she begins to reshape it. And the game makes it clear that by using these powers, she is causing real harm to reality itself. Thus, we can see Jefferson almost as a dark reflection of Max, as another person who refuses to accept the world as it is and is determined to bend it to his ideal vision. They both push for perfection, eliminating mistakes in their own destructive ways. Hold that stare there! Stay still! Shot. Am I saying that Max manipulating time in order to save her friend is the same as Jefferson murdering his students? Of course not, but I would argue that there is a thematic connection there. To what degree, that depends on your own interpretation. Then again, one might question if any photograph is able to capture a moment as is. Framing, timing, equipment, 
or the simple choice of taking a photo are all things that affect the final result. Thus, one might criticize Life is Strange's photography mechanic as overly simplistic, since it only gives the player the opportunity to take a photo and no way to actually influence the photograph itself. Even beyond that, reality is often created in perception, and a single photograph can be seen differently by different people. What is or is supposed to be can be difficult to determine. And indeed, Max has to face this dilemma herself when she realizes just how heavy the burden of choosing the right reality can be. Chloe, I, I can't keep fixing everything if all I'm gonna do is just break it over and over again. I know how this is gonna turn out, and I'm afraid I'm fucking up all these alternate realities. Wait, alternate realities? What do you mean, Max? What did you do? It is one thing to make a decision, even a difficult one, in the moment, but another thing entirely when you're able to endlessly rewind time or travel far away into the past and change present altogether. I previously referred to the doppelganger Max encounters as a dark reflection. Who... who are you? Holy shit, are you serial? I'm you, dumbass. Or I'm one of many Maxes you've left behind. Looking back, she and the other duplicates that haunt Max might feel like an odd and unnecessary addition right at the end of the game. The more I think about it though, the more appropriate they seem. Max has been, after all, defined by the duplicates that she produces, either with photographs or the alternate timelines that she creates. It is much harder though to define what these duplicates mean. I suppose that, in lack of any better interpretation, I must refer back to my original statement about art in general. It reflects parts of ourselves back at us. Thus, these mental images or photographs that Max has created I am a camera. reveal how she sees these people and, in turn, what that says about her. Most prominently, we can see guilt and insecurity reflected even in how Max's mind replicates her closest friends. I'm not into nerds, but you're pretty cute. I'm not into Max anyway, so let's bust a move. Once again, we can interpret this as a statement against Jefferson's view on photography, according to which photographs reveal the nature of their subjects, instead of that of the creator or the audience. Seriously though, I could frame any one of you in a dark corner and capture you in a moment of desperation. And any one of you could do that to me. Isn't that too easy? Too obvious? What if Arbus chose to capture people at the height of their beauty or innocence? Ultimately, it is clear that there is something wrong about how Max uses her powers. She is, in a way, closer to a god than anyone else, and her being able to tamper with reality and reshape it, like an artist would, creates some disturbing implications about the self-determination of others. And I think that by the end of the game, she is forced to seal away this power forever reverting back to only being able to experience the past through memories and, of course, photographs. It would be easy to criticize Life is Strange as a choice-based game where the results of your choices are wiped away, either by the destruction of the timeline or the death of Arcadia-based citizens, but that is only if you completely ignore the journey in favor of the destination. Having all the relationships you've built wiped away is frustrating, even painful, but that is precisely the point. I myself favor the Sacrifice Chloe ending, because though Max lost Chloe, she still carries in her the memories of that fateful week that the game takes place in. She did gain something from all that pain and suffering she went through. And so too, can we carry the things we've lost with us and let them echo in how we treat each other and the world we're living? We must not try to escape to the past, but instead use it to build our future. So do you agree with me, or do you think I'm talking pure nonsense? Leave a comment 
let me know. Let's talk about it. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can show your interest by liking, commenting, subscribing and all that usual stuff. My plans for the channel are kinda up in there right now, so it would really make a difference to know that people are excited to see more. And since it's been a while since I last uploaded a video, for those who don't know, hi, I'm Niko Nikkila. I'm a game writer and narrative designer who just graduated from university with a master's degree in literature, creative writing and media studies. And uh, since I suddenly found myself with literally nothing to do, I wanted to at least make this one video when I still had the time. My life overall is kinda in a limbo at the moment, much like during that time I talked about previously, but in a more positive way. But as I said, if you'd like to see more, do let me know. Thank you so much for watching.